competition keeps prices down far more effectively. As long as suffering of certain beings remain, I will remain in order to serve. I am a man in search of man. I was never in search of God. In conversations tonight, my guest has had a long career in the Brazilian government as its Minister of Finance and its Minister for Environment. He's been a Brazilian diplomat as the ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva and to the United States. He's currently Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Rubens Ricopero. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ricopero, uh, for most lay people, we don't really know much about uh, UNCTAD. It's one of the lesser known of United Nations agencies. Uh, and with this very distinguished career and background that you bring to UNTAG, uh, what are the objectives of... Uh, uh, you know, the basic objective of UNCTAD is to promote development and to promote a universal consensus about the policies uh, that would be development friendly. We deal mostly with trade and investment and uh, it is a relatively young agency in terms of the United Nations. It was founded in the mid-1960s. Its original aim was to provide a sort of alternative to the Bretton Woods institutions. The idea was to try to narrow the gap between the rich and the poor countries in the world and the expression of that idea was the so-called new international economic order. Now, with all the changes in the world economy, particularly this trend towards globalization, UNCTAD has also had to change its approach. It is becoming more and more pragmatic, more and more concrete. But uh, our, our main objective remains the same. How? to help developing countries integrate into the world trading system and the world economy. You know, the Bretton Wood uh, institutions were largely sort of embodied Western capitalist yeah. ideals. Yeah. Uh, to what degree are you, are you governed by that kind of framework? No, we have been seen uh, for a long time as a sort of opposite pole to that view. And even today, when you have a growing trend towards consensus, it's a more, much more hom homogeneous world. Even so, UNCTAD retains a very particular independent view of world economic events, because UNCTAD tries to reflect the perspective of developing countries, as if you could compare uh, the OECD, that is, the Organization of Industrialized Countries, tries to be the think tank of the rich countries. We, on our side, we try to play the same role for developing countries. The difference is that OECD has a limited membership. They only have now 27 countries. Whereas, in our case, we have a really universal membership. We have 188 countries, even more than the General Assembly, because you have countries like Switzerland and others which are neutral. They are not members of the General Assembly, but they play a very active role in UNCTAD. So we are a universal body with countries like China and Russia, which are not members of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. But we try to help those countries to accede to WTO. We try to help the transition countries to make the transition from socialism into a new kind of economic structure. And our uh, biggest challenge, if I could say so, is the case of the poorest among the poor, the 48 least developed countries.
countries that have an average per capita income of less than $350 a year, most of them are in Africa. How to help those countries avoid being marginalized by this trend of a globalization, which, as you know, also exacerbates competition. And uh, there are countries which are not ready for, for, for competing in the global markets. As uh, the Brazilian finance minister, you, you played a, an important role in, the, in sort of stabilizing the economy uh, in, in 1993, based on sort of World Bank models. Uh, as it were. And, you know, we've been talking about uh, the African countries struggling to regain, uh, sort of climb out of poverty. Uh, is, is, is there a model or a worldview beyond what the World Bank and the IMF uh, recommend uh, that has uh, perhaps validity and meaning for other countries? Uh, you know, in our case, uh, in reality, we didn't follow the recipe or what people call in Latin America the Washington Consensus. Uh, in general terms, we don't disagree with the basic idea that you have to restore a sound macroeconomic basis to try to have low inflation, low budget deficits in order to promote uh, a higher rate of savings, all that we, we gladly accept. The, 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 the important point of disagreement is the pace of reforms, because we consider that each country has its own cultural and political problems. In our case, in reality, we were the only country in Latin America which was able to conclude the negotiations of the debt with the private bankers without having a standby agreement with the IMF. So we never had the conditionalities of the IMF and the World Bank. That uh, was achieved at a high price, because in order to give the bankers the assurance they required, that is the treasury bonds from the US, we had to pay from our own reserves, we had to spend about $4 billion. But in compensation, we were not under uh, what you could say the sometimes not so friendly <laughs> advice of those institutions. We retained a degree of flexibility. In our case, of course, uh, our situation was special because we are like India in a very special category of countries that the American writer George Kennan, the famous author of the containment theory, he calls the monster countries, that is, the countries that at the same time have a continental territory and a very large population. You only have five in this select club, the US, Russia, India, China, and Brazil. Of course, not all countries can do the same. But I, I understand that now both the IMF and the World Bank have become more flexible. Uh, you, you have many signs of this trend. First of all, this initiative launched by uh, Jim uh, Wolfenson, the president of the World Bank, for the heavily indebted countries. As you know, until very recently, it was taboo to suggest that you could forgive the debt owned to the multilateral institutions, like the IMF and the World Bank. Now they have finally accepted. I must say that UNCTAD has been saying that for over 15 years now. And uh, this is one, by, by the way, is one of the characteristics of UNCTAD. UNCTAD sometimes has been seen as an agent provocateur, as the French say. Uh, I don't know how to put it in English, but a, an organization that provokes. Because when we introduce a new idea, generally there is a reaction saying that it is too bold. But after a few years, 
the idea is finally accepted. For instance, we were the first agency to say that the foreign debt problem of Latin American countries could never be solved only by rescheduling. It was necessary at some time to reduce the level of the debt and the level of the interest. At, at first, the reaction was almost that it was outrageous. But after five years, more or less, you had the Baker plan and then the Brady plan that is exactly the same thing. Of course, we have never been given credit for that. But our, our aim is only to, to try to help the developing countries. So in conclusion, I, I, I believe that now there is an evolution. The IMF and uh, the World Bank, they understand that you have to preserve a, a sort of uh, safety net. In our case, the, the point about which I am more and more proud about our, our achievement in Brazil was that high chronic inflation had hit particularly hard the poor because they had no way of defending themselves. Mm -hmm. And when we brought inflation down, there was an immediate uh, improvement in that situation. We Just now we had some data showing that 5 million people were liberated from the situation of uh, absolute poverty as a result of our plan. So in our case, it is one of the rare examples where stabilization was not a sacrifice to the poor. What uh, policies and strategies did you use to curtail inflation? You know, it was basically, first of all, uh, the reestablishment of uh, a balanced budget. And then we introduced a new currency, because in our case, we had a sort of uh, addiction to inflation, because for about 30 years, we had had high inflation with indexation. So people were addicted as you become addicted to a drug, and you had to cut it, to, to interrupt. When we introduced the new currency that is called real, that is real, uh, there was an immediate drop in inflation. It was really extraordinary to give you a concrete example. When I became Minister of Finance, I replaced the man who is now the president of Brazil and who has visited India some months ago. I think it was in January. He is one, he is considered the leading sociologist in South America, Mr. Cardoso. Uh, when I succeeded him, he had already started this program. But it was during my term that we introduced the new currency. At the beginning, in my first month in office, inflation was running at 50% a month, so almost 2% a day, you can imagine. And it dropped immediately to almost zero. So that was what uh, brought these tremendous benefits for people because they felt that their money, it was like if the money in your pocket would immediately gain value. You could buy something. And that was what made people support this program. To a great extent, it was a psychological effort to persuade people that stabilization was possible because we had had many failed attempts before. And as you know, economy is maybe 70% is psychology, is belief, is value. It's not what people are telling now about the globalization, for instance, that the economy is a sort of inevitable uh, imposition from uh, outside forces like the planetary system that you can't change. In reality, the economy is a product of a culture, is a product of a choice made by human beings, a choice of values. This is why I believe, by the way, 
changing a little bit from inflation to globalization, uh, this is why people now are feeling insecure in the world, because globalization uh, is being sold and even oversold as a sort of a bogeyman, as a threat. And that, of course, is the worst possible way of uh, persuading people to accept uh, a different kind of uh, organizing economic life. Go back to uh, Angtad. Uh, Angtad is, uh, is, is working in, in, in the larger context of UN agencies. Yes. And the United Nations itself uh, seems under threat yes. uh, economically in terms of its uh, credibility, uh, other than perhaps providing a useful forum for the meeting of uh, people. Uh, to what extent do you feel handicapped that Angtad is, a, is, is, is a U, uh, an agency under the uh, umbrella of the United Nations? You know, uh, you are perfectly right, because UNCTAD uh, belongs to what is called the United Nations proper. We are not a specialized agency. We are a body of the General Assembly. So our budget uh, is the same one as the, the United Nations budget, and we are very much affected by the financial crisis in the United Nations. I must say that, in my opinion, although the United Nations has many sins, uh, it, it now has been, uh, has been punished, not because of its sins, but because of its virtues. Because, you see, the United Nations, uh, with all its shortcomings, is the best achievement of mankind in terms of uh, having an organization that is at the same time universal. Nowadays, 188 countries is not the, like the League of Nations, or in the, eight, in the 19th century, where only six or seven European countries would uh, rule the world in the European concert. So there is a distinct evolution towards universalization. And secondly, also uh, an attempt at democratization of the decision-making process. Of course, democratization brings many problems, because you have to deal with diversity. To be quite frank, if you take the Bretton Woods institutions, in those institutions, uh, countries vote not according to the principle of one country, one vote but according to the capital they put there. And sometimes they block the increase of capital because they don't want to see their quota reduced. So those are institutions that are ruled by power, financial power. I'm not saying that this disqualifies them, not on the least, but it is not the same as a democratic institution. If the, the universal principle of democracy is one man, one vote, why this principle should be valid only in the interior of a country and not at the international level? You see, I, I feel that last year, when we had the 50th celebration of the United Nations, it was the missed opportunity, because there was much to be celebrated. We had half a century without a global war, without nuclear destruction. We had finally seen uh, the disappearance of the Cold War without bloodshed. So there was something concrete to celebrate, but the statesmen lacked vision. They concentrate on minor things, problems of budget, you know, the budget of the United Nations is less than the budget of the fire department of New York City. The former president of the General Assembly, who was a, 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 a next uh, foreign minister of Portugal, he said that his country, which is very small, only 10 million people, had a, a budget for education that was four times four times larger than the United Nations budget. So you see that there is a lot of exaggeration 
in the criticism addressed to the United Nations. There is concern in India, for example, that uh, certain numbers of great powers have dominated decision making in, in the Security Council, for example, and that the membership of the Security Council needs to be expanded, and India considers itself a legitimate uh, potential candidate uh, of the Security Council. My country is also one, you know. I, I fully agree with your analysis. I, I, I consider that the, the present arrangement of the Security Council they only reflect the realities of the power at the end of the Second World War. That was why you had those five, five powers which were the winners. China, of course, was included on the insistence of President Roosevelt. Now it has become a real power. At that time, it was not the case. But uh, you don't have a real balance. Because at that time, most of Asia, most of Africa, was still in a colonial state. And you don't have a good representation of the leading countries in the developing world, countries like India, like Brazil, like some countries in Africa. So I, I consider that if one should retain these exclusive permanent members, which is an exception to the idea of democracy, by the way. But if we should retain this concept, at least in order to reduce the level of inequality, we should have a broader participation. Which countries would you like to see added to the security? You know, uh, it, it is difficult to speak for every continent because the situation varies. But I consider that at least a few countries would be, I, I would say, m practically irrecusable. It is the case of India, not only because of the size of the country, but because of its foreign policy, which is, has always been very influential. I, I also think it is the case of my original country, Brazil, for the same reasons. But I see many other candidates, the case of South Africa, for instance, which now is, is being born again. You led your country's uh, delegation to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights in, yes. uh, in Geneva and we've talked about globalization and, and the World Trade Organization. Um, uh, there, is, there is grave concern in, in many developing countries, and I know China is, 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 is a loud spokesperson of this, of, of how uh, trade can be sometimes used to pressure countries on, on human rights issues, uh, which they believe are, are, are culture-specific in some ways. Uh, what is your sort of understanding and, and, and response to this predicament? Uh, my, my opinion is that trade uh, should be used uh, strictly on the basis of economic considerations. And uh, one should avoid this trend of uh, trying to put everything under the umbrella of the dispute settlement process of a WTO. Because it could easily lead to the use of a trade as a means of pressure, of a political pressure. But having said that, I think I should add that, in my opinion, human rights are universal rights. Of course, you have to pay attention to the differences in circumstances. My own country has a, a very difficult record on that account. We have problems of uh, struggles for land reform and in many regions of our country we have had many violations of the human rights no longer as in the past as a result of the policy followed by a military regime we now are a full democracy but one has to recognize that countries like ours which are struggling with poverty with the inequality among regions, among classes, they are not in the same situation as the Netherlands, for instance, which have uh, had a tremendous progress in, during the four last centuries. 
So you have to look at differences in circumstances, not as an excuse, but as a concrete reason to give help to the countries that are really serious about improving the, the record on human rights. Anyway, I, I really believe that the reason of the existence of the state, the raison d'etre of the state, is to promote uh, the best possible level of well-being and to reduce the level of suffering of its population. So all countries have to be accountable to those, uh, those standards, and I believe that applies to human rights, but also to the economy. This is why I was saying that the economy should not create fear, insecurity about the future. Many developing countries like uh, India perhaps uh, fear globalization not just because of its uh, obvious implicit economic agenda, but they somehow feel that it's, it's, it's a kind of invasion of, of culture, of identity. And, uh, and, and there's a resistance in that sense to, to sort of international organizations who promote this agenda. Uh, as, as, as someone uh, who is going to be in, who is an agent provocateur, as you mentioned, <laughs> with UNCTAD, uh, how do you respond to this, this perception? I mean, even France in the WTO talks was, was worried about what American television would do to French culture. Uh, you see, uh, I also believe that uh, it would be a mistaken concept of globalization to, to understand it as a sort of uh, uniformization. Globalization is the unification of the human space. But unification, that is the reduction of barriers, doesn't mean the homogenization, the forceful homogenization of culture. What does it mean? It is uh, the end of isolation. Uh, you know the distinguished late historian of India, Panikkar, in his uh, the history of Western dominance in Asia, he called the, the, the period of colonization the Vasco da Gama period of uh, Asian history. Because the, the, those uh, important travels of, uh, of uh, opening of routes, like to the Americas by Columbus or da Gama to Asia, they started a period of uh, oppression, of imperialism, of slave trade, but at the same time, they started also a process that put an end to the isolation in which the several different branches of the human civilization were living so far. Europe ignored India or ignored China or the important African kingdoms or the, the pre-Columbus American cultures. Nowadays, we know each other. We no longer have isolated countries. You see Myanmar, Vietnam, now uh, North Korea. All countries are integrating in the same interchange. But that will enrich humanity. You see how many people now in the Western world are looking at India for their spiritual enrichment. So the diversity of culture will be an asset. And uh, I, I believe that one should resist the imposition of a cultural uniformity. But as I said, globalization is not uniformity. It's only unification. It is contact. It is the increase of interaction. Mr. Caparo, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you.